equations. Then there's a unique local space time which involves you in that data. And as I indicated, the result involves local solvability of a system of nonlinear wave equations. Because there's a gauge issue. You have, to, you have to choose coordinates correctly in order to write it as a hyperbolic system. But you can do that. It's, it's a well worked out theory uh, that, uh, that uh, initial data satisfying the constraint equation determines a unique local space time. Now, now, of course, a lot of people are trying to understand more globally what happens with this problem. And that's a very difficult problem which I won't say very much about. In fact, there's actually not a lot of progress on the global, the global uh, evolution problem at this point. Um, OK, and, and let me just make a, a, an analog to this, which might uh, be something that you uh, learned in undergraduate differential geometry. So it, you should compare it to the fundamental theorem of hypersurfaces, or surfaces in R3. So the, uh, the, the fundamental theorem of surfaces in R3 goes back to Bonnet in the 17th century. And what, what it says is that if you if you start with, again, an initial data set, that is, you have a metric locally, say, and a second fundamental form, you want to say, you want to understand when you can isometrically embed the metric into Rn plus 1. Question. With, yeah, For question. local, uh, local space-time uh, solution is local in space and local in time. Uh, you can make it global in space under certain conditions, yeah. But it, 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 does, it certainly means that. So short time um, existence. Yeah, short time existence. So for example, if you had a compact Cauchy surface, then you can get short time behavior. Or I, I'm interested really in the asymptotic of the flat case. So again, you can solve it globally uh, for short time. That's right. <coughs> OK, and so, um, so the parallel to uh, uh, surfaces in Rn uh, is uh, the says that if you, if you take, if you want to realize an isometrically embed with a given metric and a given second fundamental form, you can do that locally uniquely if and only if the gaussian Donati equation is That is the full set of gaussian Donati equations. That's a bigger set than the one we looked at. Um, and so, uh, so that theorem is a much easier theorem because it involves uh, solving an overdetermined system of PEs and they're of what's called Frobenius type. So that means that they can actually be solved by solving a family of ODEs and checking compatibility conditions. Okay, and, so, and so this is an interesting parallel theorem. It sort of corresponds to the case where the, where the space time is flat. Right? You want to have a flat space time and then the conditions are a full set of Gaussian equations. And so, and so then the embedding problem is much easier. Uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the Einstein cases, it, it's a system of wave equations, so you have to use a more, a more difficult Okay, so that's the initial value problem. So I want to just say quickly uh, what happens, what the matter, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, what happens is instead of, instead of being zero, uh, we have we have uh, components of the stress energy tensor, and and the uh, this is as I said this this the uh, uh, the, the uh, this equation uh, equals zero came from the zero zero component of the. Uh, of the Einstein equations, and T00 is by definition mu. So mu, mu is the observed mass density. So what you should think of is you can take initial data, you should think of, of an observer which moves orthogonal to, the, to the, uh, the, the data. And then for that observer, mu is the observed mass density of the matter fields. The rest. So in relativity, in special relativity, the, the mass is a function of the observer. Right? So general mass and linear momentum combined to be a, a four vector. And so the same thing is true here. And so those the, the four vector mu and j uh, is represents the observed uh, mass and momentum density vectors of the uh, of the matter. Okay, so that's should be thought about four vector. So they just correspond to the to the observed matter field to the, the observed matter flow vector if you like for an observer moving orthogonally to the they are, and they, and they appear on the uh, uh, sort of the source terms in, in the constraint um, uh, the the Okay, and so and so the the, the, the main feature that we're going to use in the matter field, of course, if, if we were studying a specific matter field like like a scalar field or the Max, a Maxwell field or something, then we would have a specific formula for u and j in terms of the field. Okay, but. The, but there are some general features of matter fields which are which are normally assumed, and in order to make the space-time physically realistic, one assumes them. In particular, I'm just going to use I'm just going to need an energy condition, which is called the dominant energy condition, and it's 
equivalent of what it's, its condition on the stress energy tensor. And it just says that if you take two, I should say forward pointing uh, time like mill vectors, then T of it is non negative. And so what it corresponds to is the condition that for any initial data, the mass density is bigger than or equal to the norm of the of the of J, the momentum density. And so and so what that means going back to the the four vector of J, it means that it's a it's a uh, it's a time like vector. So it's really just the statement that that um, that that matter signals cannot travel faster than the speed of light. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. So so in terms of initial data it's the condition that mu is larger than or equal to the point of J. And so we always will assume that. So notice, notice in the special case, so there's a case called time symmetric, that's where the initial velocity is zero for the uh, data. Uh, then the dominant energy condition is equivalent to saying the scalar curvature is not negative. Uh, because <clears throat> the condition, if P is zero, then, then this first equation uh, is just a, a constant times the scalar curvature, and then mu, mu is being not negative, it tells us the scalar curvature. Okay, and so in that case, it's a purely uh, it's just an assumption on the on the metric um, Okay, and so um, and so we're going to talk about as I said, I'm, I'm going to be mostly interested in asymptotically flat spaces, and what those are are um, uh, initial data sets. So we're thinking of a three manifold or generally an n manifold where the metric and the second fundamental form fall off at infinity, so they decay at infinity. Uh, so it's um, it's the analog in general relativity of a finite mass distribution in Newtonian gravity. So when you study Newtonian gravity, you usually take a, a finite amount of mass and then you study the gravitational force induced by that particle, right? And so that, that's a theory. So if you look very, from very far away at, that, at that, uh, uh, that massive body, then it begins to look more and more like a, like a point mass. So the, so the gravitational field will fall off as you, as you go further away. And so that's the idea for, for the asymptotically flat. So it's kind of a boundary condition for the, um, for the initial data. So it says that in suitable coordinates, the metric falls off at a particular rate. And here I put, this is sort of a standard uh, rate of fall off that's assumed. But I'm going to be looking more generally at, uh, at, at more what, what sort of asymptotics one can achieve through the constraint uh, equations in this talk. And so, um, so this is, so let me just explain the terminology here. So th this means the difference between the metric and uh, the Euclidean metric in these coordinates falls off like a constant times uh, mod x to the 2 minus n. So that, that they, you'll recognize that if you, uh, the e person is the fall off of the Green's function in, in for our equivalent velocity rate right, in, in Rn. And the, the sub 2 there means that you can differentiate the, 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 uh, uh, the fall off twice. So it means, for example, that um, if I take one derivative dgi j dxk, then that will fall off by my x to be 1 minus n, 1 over faster. And two derivatives d squared g would, would fall off by my x to be minus n. And so there's a, there's a, there's a question mark. So there's a, you know, there are various technical issues about what you require. In the, uh, in the fall off, and so uh, so I'm requiring two derivatives to fall off. Okay, and for the uh, second fundamental form, because it involves it involves a derivative of the metric, I, I need one derivative and I have one order of faster to fall off. Okay, and so um, so the two basic examples for this talk uh, are going to be the Minkowski and short shield solutions. Okay, so the Minkowski one is one that we talked about. That's the just the uh, Euclidean space with the standard Lorentz metric. The other one, which is a, a curved space, a non-flat space, is called the Schwarzschild space time. It, it has many characterizations, uh, and it uh, I've written down initial data for it. So you can also write down the the, uh, the actual space time metric. Uh, 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 it, it's a, it, it's a metric actually which is static. It, it doesn't change in time. And so it has a simple form, space time metric. But but I'm just going to think of the data here for a moment. So it can be written in various coordinates, but uh, uh, a nice one for me is the uh, uh, conformally flat coordinate. So it's a, it's a function. So, so we think that it's defined on Rn minus the origin. <clears throat> and just think of standard coordinates. 
x n, and then the metric is uh, is just a, a function times the Euclidean metric, and the function is this particular function. There's a parameter e in there called the, the mass or the energy, uh, and uh, it's one plus two. This is mod x to the power. Then I've raised it to that, that power four or minus two. Okay, and so the, the advantage of writing it in this form is that you can sort of see directly that it satisfies the constraint equation. So in this case, it's a, this is a time symmetric case, so p is zero. Uh, the scalar curvature of this metric, uh, it turns out when you write a, a metric in this form, it just involves the Laplacian of that function. And so you can see that that function is just a, is a harmonic function. Away from the margin. It's the, the radially symmetric harmonic function. Okay, and so this satisfies the constraints of the terms of space time, but it's a, it's actually a static space time. So th this is um, this uh, this solution is is the analog of uh, uh, the exterior field of a point mass in Newtonian gravity. It's, it's called the static black hole solution. So it models a um, it models a black hole. So it's, it's a singular solution, as you can see, and it doesn't change in time. There's a, there's a, Called the static black hole. It's a very, very, very much studied solution. Discovered around 1920 or so, before that. So it's discovered quite early. <coughs> okay, so, um, uh, right, so these, so these, these two uh, will play an important role for us. And so, um, one of the important uh, notions that I want to use for asymptotically flat space times uh, is the, uh, the energy and linear moment. So these are called ADM uh, energy and linear momentum. And I've written a formula for them. So it's kind of a complicated formula, and I, I, I want to explain it a little bit. So, uh, so let me motivate it in the following way. So um, if you think of, um, if you think of uh, um, Newtonian gravity, then, um, then you have some finite mass distribution in R3, so it's the sum domain, omega in R3. And then you have a, a density function, so well as non-negative, say, supported in that, in that region omega. Then in order to determine uh, the gravitational force determined by this uh, body, you solve the Poisson equation. So you, take, you solve the plus and the G is uh, <coughs> minus sign there, minus 4 pi times rho. And then the gravitational force on a, on, a, um, on a unit mass away from there is the gradient of that potential function. So that's the, the gravitational potential. Okay, and so, and so the role, the energy, the, the energy in this expression is analogous to the total mass of this, this gravitational, uh, of this in the gravity. So first, the total mass is the integral over omega of rho, the x. Right? That's the mass. On the other hand, I can write that in a different way, right? If I integrate the, if I integrate this on a large ball, uh, say, my x less than or equal to r, and both sides, and my x less than or equal to r, then I can also write the mass. So this is just minus four pi times the mass. So I can write it as minus one over four pi. <coughs> Now this part here, this, this is the Laplacian, so the divergence of the gradient. And so I can use the divergence there and write that as a boundary of R. So that's the integral over the boundary of the mod x equals R. Of the flu a flux integral, so it would be d dr. Well, sigma, integrated over a sphere, a large sphere. Okay, and so, and so then I can let R tend to infinity and I just get the mass. Well, actually it's equal to the mass even for R. Maybe not. Okay, and so, and so in general relativity, this expression doesn't make sense because if you're trying to measure the, the mass density of a gravitational field, there is no local expression for that. Now, there are very interesting notions of quasi-local mass which people have studied. So there are some ways of measuring energy contact in, within a finite uh, region, but I'm not going to go into that here. It's a rather complicated thing to do in, in relativity. But, but for the total mass, you can... Uh, you, uh, while you don't have an expression like that, this is this asymptotic expression is the analog of the one there. Okay, and so, and so the idea, roughly speaking, and this isn't quite right as you'll see, but the idea is that a general, a general 
solution of the uh, uh, a general initial data set should near infinity be something like a short shield, right? Because if you look at it from really far away, it should look like <coughs> sort of a, a point mass or a, a, a um, static star to leading order. And so, and so, um, um, and so the asymptotic interval there for the in, in, in the case of the, the, the short shield, that, that asymptotic quantity will give you exactly that energy. Effect. And so the idea is the energy is the is the energy of the oscillating short shield. So you think of it as asymptotic to well, it's asymptotically flat, but to the next order, it's asymptotic to the short shield. If you had good asymptotics, something like that would be true. And so uh, and so that's the uh, that's called the energy. And then the, the linear momentum is a function. And again, it's a space time thing. It's, it's because it's it's because the the energy and linear momentum together form the four vector, and so and so that also has an asymptotic expression. Um, and let me just say that the limits exist under quite general asymptotic decay conditions. And I, I just let me just explain uh, why the um, why the limit exists. And so the limits exist because of the constraint equations. Okay. So um, uh, and and they exist. I mean, you might think if, if you look at I mean, if you just took the absolute value of the expression there, uh, then if your, you know, gij um, falls off like uh, Euclidean plus uh, mod x to the 2 minus n, well, you differentiate once you get mod x to the 1 minus n. And so if you take the absolute, absolute value and integrate, you would expect that you would get a finite number. You get a bounded number. Because the sphere grows like that. The definition of the energy is going to be serious. give me some. Uh, some, some more motivation of how these come from? Because this is still right. very different from what you said there from the four models. Um, it's, um, yeah, so I'm doing, I think I'm answering your question right now. I'm, I'm getting there. Okay. Right. So I, I want to explain more about why this, why, why it's relevant, I mean, why this term comes up. Okay, so the, the uh, okay, so I, I just mentioned this as a very elementary analog of, of the formula. But, um, so, so, but actually, you, you can you can assume much much weaker decay conditions, and you can you still get the existence of these limits, even in cases where the absolute value goes to infinity. So there's some sort of cancellation that occurs in these integrals, and, and the reason for it is the following thing. And so let's just look at the first one because the second one's kind of similar, and we'll be a little short on time. So, so the reason is because the constraint equation involves the scalar curvature. Let's take the vacuum case just for simplicity. Uh, let's assume. Let's just assume that p is zero, so we're in the simplest case. Uh, then, 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 the, then r equals zero would be the constraint equation. Okay, and, and the metric is close to Euclidean, so gij is, is approximately the Euclidean metric. Okay, and of course r is an expression involving second derivatives of the metric. Okay, so so if you look at that expression carefully, what you see is that r is the following term. There's a leading order term involving second derivatives. So that would be uh, uh, it would be di of gij, and then there's a term which is minus di di of gjj, and then there's a term. Now there are two types of error terms. So you, so the metric close to Euclidean. Uh, the, the two error terms. There's a term which is uh, of the form g minus delta times second derivative of g, and then there's an error term which is the form first derivative squared. An expression. So just write down the local expression for the scalar curvature. Use the fact that the metric is close to Euclidean. You can see that you can write it as this linear operator on G, and then plus th these terms which are thought of as error terms. Now the important thing is R is decays quickly. In fact, let's assume it's zero for simplicity. Then this expression here, which of course is a divergence, is integrable under appropriate decay conditions. And so that's what causes, that's what forces it. The existence of the limit. So in particular, um, if, if we assume, say, that uh, that g minus delta goes like x to the minus q for some q, then this is an x to the minus q. Then the second derivatives we're allowed to differentiate twice. This would be x to the minus 2 minus, minus uh, q. And so these two together give us mod x to the uh, minus 2 minus 2q. And whereas here, this would be uh, mod x to the uh, 1 minus q uh, squared. Uh, squared times 2, so I get the same order. Sorry, uh, x to the, uh, sorry, this is, oh no, that's right, so this is the 
So the two are in the same order. And so in particular, you see, if this expression is integrable, then I can prove the existence of the limit by the divergence theory. Okay? Notice that this, this boundary term that occurs there is exactly the boundary term you get if you apply the divergence theorem to that expression. Okay, so what I, what I would do is just look at the difference between two large spheres, the difference of those integrals. And then I would apply the divergence theorem, and then it would tell me the, the integral inside, the, vol the volume integral, which is finite on the whole space, which represents the difference of those two integrals. And so that will, so the, that difference will go to zero as I, as I let the radius go to infinity. Okay, so it's really a, it really comes from, so you can find that expression by um, looking at the linearization of the scalar curvature function at the infinity. That's what that, that expression is. Okay, and the other one is similar. It, it, the existence follows from the, uh, the second, assist, the second set of constraint equations. Okay, so, <coughs> so in fact, you can see, the, this, these limits will exist as long as this number is less than minus n. So in other words, 2 plus 2q is bigger than n, and that means that q is bigger than n minus 2 over 2. So, so you can actually allow much weaker decay and still get the existence of the, of the uh, energy and moving momentum. So in particular, this is only half of the decay of the, that we assumed originally. It's half of the Schwarzschild decay. Okay, so again, for, for a decay like that, the absolute value of the integrals will, will blow up, will go to infinity. But because of the divergence, the, the, there's a sort of cancellation that occurs in the limits, limits exist. Yeah. And so, again, the idea, you, you can explicitly calculate this for the Schwarzschild solution, and you show, and in fact, that's the reason for that funny constant out front. That, that it gives you the right number, it gives you the energy of the short field solution. Okay, so those are the energy and linear momentum. And again, you should think of those as fitting together to form a vector. So it's a four vector. And uh, generally, the, the mass is the uh, square root of e squared minus p squared. Okay, so the positive energy theorem is something uh, uh, I'm going to use here. Uh, so what it says is that if we assume the dominant energy condition, which we always assume, then, in fact, the energy is not negative, and it's zero only if the data is trivial. So trivial data means that it can be isometrically embedded in Minkowski space, as a space like microspace. Okay, so it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, x naught equals zero. It doesn't have to be the infinity, but it could be any space like microspace. And, and the space-time generated would still be the, the flat space. Okay, so that's the positive energy. It tells us that this asymptotic limit that we wrote down is always non-zero except in the trivial case. So it's, it's giving you, you can think of it as saying, um, as telling you that, that uh, space times in relativity can't decay to the Euclidean space too quickly. In other words, they can't be too flat unless they're trivial. And so uh, I want to, the main theorem I'm going to talk about is a more precise version of that. Okay, and so, and so actually the problem can be posed in any dimension and proven in various cases using mean curvature ideas, which Yao and I did, and uh, there's also a Dirac operator approach. Actually, in three dimensions, there's another very interesting approach in the p equals zero case, which is called the inverse mean curvature flow. Beautiful geometric flow argument, which gives somewhat stronger results in, the, in that case. And that was done by Garrosh and Elman. And actually, I, I should say that uh, recently, Ike and Eric Long, Juan Chuan, here, Dan Lee and I, uh, gave a, we, we strengthened the mean curvature approach uh, in a slightly different uh, uh, method to prove the stronger inequality if E is bigger than or equal to P. The original argument that Yon and I doesn't directly give that in terms of data. Um, okay, and so I finally did part two. Uh, so <laughs> yesterday I went too fast and I went too slow. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll get it just right. <laughs> You know the story of Goldilocks, Goldilocks in the uh, Western city. So the, 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 the porridge is too hot the first day, too cold the second. Right. Uh, energy moment, are they equivalent on the energy moment? Are they equivalent on the energy moment? Yeah, they're, they're conserved quantity of energy moment. Okay. Um, Right. Okay, so I want to talk about geometry of uh, initial data and a specific question, and then I'll, I'll talk about the uh, recent result, which partially answers it. 
So, um, um, okay, so, uh, so, so it's related to trap services, okay, and so, and so the idea here is, this is an idea that goes back to uh, Penrose. The idea is that if you take, uh, if you take an initial data set, <coughs> Let's take let's think of an asymptotically flat initial data set M, and let's take a surface in there. Let's say we're in three dimension. Okay? We can take a closed surface in there, single two dimensional surface. Then you can study. <coughs> you can ask the question: Suppose you move surface so that there's a local space time defined by this, and if you move the surface in the in the forward pointing null direction, so you think of uh, this vector, this null vector, which we could write as so if we take the time-like unit normal E0 for the point, and we take the outward normal nu to the surface, the surface sigma in M3, then this, this null vector is E0 plus nu. So it's the so at each point, actually at each point there are there are really just a pair of lines which are null directions because the, the orthogonal space to the two-dimensional surface would be a two-dimensional uh, a two-dimensional um, Lorentz metric that are just like when there's a pair of lines. So we take, we deform it in the forward pointing outward direction. Okay, and, and you can then ask the question whether the area of the surface increases or decreases. Of course, it may increase in some places and decrease in others, but in, in case in case it happens when you move the surface outward, the area decreases at all points, then uh, then the surface is called uh, outer trap. Okay, so that's an outer trap surface. And so a picture of that, so, so the, the idea is that outer trap surfaces are, are sort of telling you that, that, that things are pinching off, that, that, you know, something like a neck pinch or so. And so, um, and so I have a picture of it here. So the, the outer trap surfaces are related to horizons in, in, uh, in relativity. And so the, the basic theorem, which goes back to about 1970 at Penrose, is that whenever you have an outer trap surface in, uh, say, an asymptotically flat space time, then the space-time evolution is necessarily incomplete. Okay, so it means that it's singular. There's, there's no global single evolution in that. So if you like, it's, it's a criterion which tells you that, that it's a largeness criterion that says if you're far enough away from uh, uh, Minkowski space, you, you will have blow-up in the Einstein. So it's a blow-up criterion, like the existence of trapped surfaces. So, so it's a very important thing from a dynamical point of view for the, uh, for the Einstein equations. And it also has some very interesting geometry connected to it. So let's let's write down the conditions more carefully. So um, so again, I said this yesterday. If uh, if we take a, a submanifold of Riemannian or Lorentz manifold and we deform it orthogonally to itself, x is orthogonal, then the logarithmic rate of change in the area is given by the, the mean curvature in the x direction. Okay. So in our case, we're moving in a specific uh, null direction, and so the um, and so that, that corresponding mean curvature has two parts. One comes from the mean curvature, or, or the, the trace of the, uh, the second fundamental form of m in the space time, and the other is from the mean curvature of sigma in m. Okay, and it's the, the sum of those two terms. This, so h is the mean curvature of sigma in the initial data, and this is the trace of, sigma, the trace of p restricted to sigma. So that condition, the trapping condition, computationally, is an inequality which relate, which tells us that the surface has negative mean curvature. Actually, I noticed when I was going through this talk that I changed the sign from yesterday. Yesterday I said it's minus h. Mm -hmm. uh, so in relativity, uh, people usually use this invention because they think of it in terms of expansion, of the expansion of volume, rather than sort of the second fundamental form. So, so, uh, and so this side is a little more. Okay, and so in particular, again, if the p is zero, that is, we have zero initial velocity, it's just the condition that h, the mean curvature, is less than equal to zero, point wise. That's the traffic condition. Um, okay, and so and so in, in particular, this this condition is clearly related to uh, the theory of minimal surfaces, or actually more generally, when there's a second fundamental form p, uh, they're called MOTs. So MOTs stands.